Uh, let's start with what what is Backstage? Backstage is a platform for building developer. And portals. what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> So why don't you tell us a little bit more about what Backstage actually does? Oh, great. It's surprisingly hard to put Backstage into words. Backstage is a hub for engineers to, I don't know, do your job, <laughs> to figure stuff out. <laughs> it's so hard to like define. Um... It can be best thought of as our central nervous system. Tyson likes to call it an app store with an attitude, in that Backstage makes it easy to find all the different apps that you would want as a developer to do your job. It uh, helps engineering teams to create stuff, to manage stuff, and to find stuff. It's something that can replace all my tabs. I don't know if that does it justice. And the idea is really to centralize and simplify end-to-end -end software development. An ever-growing one-stop shop for all your developer needs. It's uh, all, all the things that you love. Welcome to Nerd Out at Spotify, where we bring you behind the curtain of the world's most popular audio streaming subscription service. We'll talk to Spotify developers about the challenging tech problems they're solving every day. Machine learning, open source, clouds, tabs versus spaces. No topic is too big or too small. I'm Dave Zolotowski, principal engineer at Spotify. In this episode, we're talking about every engineer's favorite topic, infrastructure tooling. Okay, maybe not every engineer's favorite topic, but that's kind of why Spotify has been so focused on it. Even if you're working in an engineering team as small as, say, 20 developers, you'll find a lot of variety in the tools and processes being used. When you're in an organization as big as Spotify, it gets much more complicated. We have thousands of developers managing tens of thousands of software components. It can be a lot to keep track of, and the complexity of it all can be a major source of frustration for our engineers. At Spotify, the team responsible for tooling infrastructure and the overall developer experience is called Platform. Platform considers their fellow Spotify engineers their customers. And Platform's job is to help those customers build quickly and safely at Spotify scale. In other words, make it easier for our developers to do their jobs. Today, I'll talk with Lee Mills and Austin Lehman from Platform. They both work on Backstage, the developer portal we built at Spotify and have been using internally for years before we open sourced it in the beginning of 2020. What is a developer portal? Well, we'll get to that. For now, let's just say Backstage is what we use to maintain the most important metric we know, developer happiness. Hi, I'm Lee. I'm the engineering manager for Backstage. I'm Austin. I'm a product manager at Spotify, and I spend my days thinking about Backstage. Basically, on a day-to-day -day basis, I split my time between talking to people who use Backstage, but more broadly, talking to people who are developers. And my job is basically to sit with them, understand what their problems are, help people be more productive. So that means I spend a lot of my time sitting with people who are really what I think of as my customers or developers building products and understanding what they're going through and understanding how we might be able to improve their lives and build better experiences. What was the path to getting a job like that? When I went to college, they were like, you know, there's this thing, it's called computer science. And I was like, oh, that sounds brutal, but okay, uh, I'll try it. You say I have to do it to get an engineering degree, so why not? It all started from there. I ended up learning to write code, learning to really more abstractly break problems down and, and think about what am I really trying to solve and, and flex almost an artistic muscle in figuring out how to solve those problems in an eloquent way. And so that really has remained true for me, but I've shifted from day-to-day -day writing code to more thinking about how to build products and how to invest in really advocate for investment in products like this. I switched to products mostly because I wanted more investment as a developer and I didn't know a better way to do it. Before you discovered product, what kind of engineering did you really want to get into? I had no idea is the short answer. When I was cutting my teeth figuring out what engineering was, that was when basically anyone would pay you a bunch of money to build websites. And I was like, these are really easy. Like, why do they think this is so hard? Honestly, that's basically what subsidized me getting through school. I then followed that path further into the stack just as I needed to build more mature websites and realized, oh, you could actually have like a real running back end. You kind of run your own databases and like this is what all that actually looks like. But every time it came back to like, how can I make this reusable or how can I find some way of abstracting this very particular problem that I'm solving, but solve a more general one? And people just kept saying, no, 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 you actually just need to solve that problem. Like we need to ship this thing. And I was like, no, this is definitely reusable. Like we can definitely do this. 
And then they were like, all right, well, why don't you just go work on things that actually need that? And so I've just progressively worked my way back to focusing more on infrastructure, more on reusable platforms. And that's, I guess, evolved from a college requirement through to what the market was actually interested in and me just being interested in trying different things along the way. That's a really cool story. Let's see if Lee can top it. So Lee, tell us about yourself. I don't know if I can top that. I think my journey getting here has been a bit more random. So I've been at Spotify now almost two years. That entire time I've focused on effectively developer productivity. I focused on the backstage platform. How I got here, wow, I was not as organized as you, Austin. <laughs> um, actually, I didn't study computer science at, at university. I was in the music side of things. So once upon a time, I was behind a, a recording desk. And it was somewhere in, in the middle of university, I got into programming for art installations. This thing where you have a room and like people walk in and it's abstract and it then reacts to the people in the room and that side of stuff. That's how I got into computers and coding and that side of stuff. And then between there and here, I've done everything else. I was a lecturer at university for a while. I was an elementary school teacher. I was a boom up for the BBC. I got to work with Patrick Stewart. So I tried everything. And somehow at some point I ended up uh, iOS 3, it was, I think. So when the, the iPhones came along and then iOS 3 is where they opened up with the App Store. And at the time I was out in Korea and I had the very first parking app for the iPhone in Korea, which was a terrible app. When I look at it, it was awful. Literally all it was is like, whenever you stop, you could press a button and say, this is my car. And then a bit later on, you could come back and it'd give you this. You made millions on that, right? (laughs) No, I didn't make millions. But at one point, I was in the top of the charts in Korea on the store there. It did quite well until it got to the point that I just didn't update it anymore and it kind of (laughs) fell. And then when I moved back to Europe, I just fell into my career in engineering. So the cool thing is working on like productivity or internal tooling to support other teams and things like that is I was probably never a good coder. I probably shouldn't say this on it. You know, I work at Spotify. I, I shouldn't say this, but I was probably never a really good coder, but I'm a good problem solver. And I love focusing on that problem side of stuff and particularly on customer problems. And Spotify is doing so much in that space that that's how I ended up here. What does a typical day to day look like for you? A day will go from sitting down with Austin talking about like, how do we do this? Where does that go? Through to supporting the engineers and helping them kind of grow in their careers and that side of stuff. And then through to the whole day-to-day machinations of that with the team. The most fun thing in all of that is we sit next to our customers. So if I worked on the Spotify app, the majority of customers are outside somewhere in other buildings, in the cars, in the doing everything else. For me, my customers sat right next to me. Well, when I'm in the office right now, my wife sat next to me. But and she doesn't use your products? She doesn't use Backstage, unfortunately. She does use Spotify. What Lee said about having your customers close, all the things I said before about how I got here and why I'm here, that's definitely true. The reason I'm still here is because I have become really rejuvenated every day by hearing from our customers literally within minutes of doing something. Like the feedback loops when you're building internal tools are very tight, but they're also very blunt. There is no sugarcoating, especially when you're building developer tools. They'll just immediately respond back, not even with negative feedback. They'll just send back a PR that's, this is horrible. Just the the speed and the cycle time is so incredibly high, I think, when you're building internal tools that it's really addicting. I have a hard time believing that the blunt feedback you get from internal developers is nearly as blunt as some of our one-star App Store reviews, but we can get into that (laughs) in some other podcasts. I've spoken to a lot of other companies and a lot of other infrastructure teams, and This thing where you have product people in an internal facing infrastructure org isn't really typical of other companies. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about what you know of that role, how unique it is at Spotify versus some other companies. It's valuable to just bring diverse perspectives in the room at a totally abstract level. From an expertise perspective, I think having product in the room, having design in the room, even when you're building developer tools is absolutely vital. Even further, we've found within Spotify that it's really an even more diverse team than that. It's it's also having marketing there. It's having data scientists there who can help you really understand what is the product that you're bringing to market? Who is your market? And how can you really become obsessed with building products that really delight them? I think it's a really natural progression for where we're seeing the industry going. I mean, if you look at, you know, by 20 2025, there's going to be something like 28 or 30 million developers walking around on this planet. And so I think if we were just having developers building 
products for developers, I'm, I'm sure we'd build some great things. But I think the market and, and the demand is becoming so big that it's vital that we really invest in, in bringing well-rounded and diverse teams to these massive problem spaces. I think that's the trick, right? Having that diversity in one, and it forces us to evaluate things as a human problem, if you will. So it's not just we have some infrastructure problem, we need to put some tooling in place. It's not like coming at it from that, okay, well, if we spool up a Kubernetes cluster, we've solved the problem. It's much more what's the actual problem? How can we solve it for them, the people, the group that's having it? That's kind of built into Spotify's culture, which is awesome. Overall, in the developer environment, do you feel like experience that developers have today is much easier than we had before a lot of these tools? We can do things like spin up cloud services really quickly with just one click without ever having to worry about racking and stacking the servers. There's a lot more power we have today. There's also an incredible amount of open source tooling we have that gives us all of this power for free. And on the other hand, developers are responsible for way more than they ever were before. Things like DevOps or a lot of other modern development practices. So what do you think? Is this kind of an easier time to be a developer or not? I think it's a significantly harder time to be a developer. And I might even say, I think that tomorrow is probably the hardest day to be a developer that there has been. To me, it all comes down to the complexity. And actually, a lot of it comes down to choice. There's now so many incredible building blocks out there. There's so many incredible foundations to build on. But at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is build something for an end user and Even for me as an engineer, like when I want to go build something like on a weekend, if I'm trying to like hack my house or something for me, it's like, okay, what is going to be the simplest thing for me to maintain? I spent two years at at Spotify thinking about Kubernetes. My house is not running on Kubernetes. Trust me, it's running on a Raspberry Pi. Like that's what's running in my house because that's what I understand. And that's what's super easy for me to maintain and play with. So it's a super challenging time to be a developer. And I think that great opportunity of all the technology and all the complexity that is out there, you can build just incredible experiences that wouldn't have been possible before. But I also think there's so many trade-offs that are now in the hands and on the mind of a developer all the time. But my hope is that we can give people tools to not say this is the technologies you should use to counter that complexity, but we should say these are the trade-offs in using that technology. And here's how you should think about it. Go make the choice and good luck hacking your house. Just on that note, I want to make sure that you know that Matthias's house does run Kubernetes and he did a lightning talk at KubeCon a few years ago exactly about that. So I don't want to let you discourage everyone in the world that's trying to run Kubernetes in their houses with your Raspberry Pi propaganda. I totally did not watch Matthias's KubeCon talk. I did. And my house is now running on four Raspberry Pis that run a Kubernetes cluster. Perfect. See, you can do both. <laughs> the downside of that is, just as Ossie was saying, though, funnily enough, is the complexity. So at one point, I'm pretty certain if you turned off the lights in a certain order in our house, it unlocked the front door. So like, <laughs> like it's way more complex today. But if you hit all the light switches at once, it'll scale up and handle that. Well, the, the, maybe this is what I'm going to go and try that. <laughs> but before you do, I want you to answer the same question Austin did about whether you think life for developers today is easier or harder. So life as a developer today is undeniably harder. It's more complex. There is awesome things happening. Like how much do I wish back when I was doing things on a, on a daily basis was NPM a thing. I can install all of this stuff and like I get all of this power and then, you know, like three lines and it spills up a web service with authentication and this, that and the other. The downside to that type of thing is the complexity under the hood and understanding what's going on. It's almost like in some ways you have to now be not an expert, but you have to have a really good understanding about infrastructure choices you make underneath, what you build on top, what's open source, what packages do you want to use and install and build from. I want to go back to the days where I was programming on an LC2 Mac with basically just a terminal and some scripts. I felt safe in those days. It's so exciting right now and it's so cool, but it's very complex and there's so much choice. Choice is probably the biggest thing now. Austin talked a little bit about the size of this massive problem and I wanted to hear a little more about the size of this problem at Spotify to get a feel for kind of how large the engineering community is, how many customers you really have and what those people's lives are like. What tools are they using and are they just constantly deploying things and we're doing like hundreds of deploys a day and getting tons of things out the door or there kind of a ton of other problems that are keeping us from being in this idealized thousands of deployments a day kind of world like what's going on in their lives? 
So Spotify, the R&D department's pretty sure it's around 2,000 plus now. So that's hundreds of teams. It almost doesn't even matter how many we have today because tomorrow it's going to be double. There's so many developers entering Spotify every day and we have such a, a strong engineering core, which is fantastic. But if we can't help them solve, efficiently solve their jobs to be done, then, then we've failed. The scale of the problem is immense, but I think what we're trying to do is bring down the chaos of that environment. So I think it's really important to think about this as a multidimensional problem in how we help developers efficiently execute or complete their jobs to be done. So something that is built into Spotify's culture is the autonomy of all of the different teams in the way that they operate, in the way that they work. And as Spotify grows, so does that autonomy. It compounds and grows out. Like it's never a, you must use this. This is the way you ha should do this. It's all about guiding, nudging, presenting best practices and things like that, and giving a way for teams to still continue to own the way that they operate and implement. And that's where we're heading with Backstage. What differentiates Backstage from all of these different tools that are out there and why it's vital is Backstage prioritizes developers and their software to create the most effective developer experience in the world. Do you have like a specific scenario that's just completely different now that we have Backstage? So I, I think if you put yourself in the perspective of a new engineer who just rocks up to Spotify and says, all right, I'm here for one day and I want to solve this one problem. I need to build a microservice and visualize an experience within you know, the mobile client in order to do that. So you would open up Backstage, you would go to a set of templates. You could say, okay, I, what I want to do is create a microservice. I want it to follow the golden path, which is the simplest microservice. The majority of it will be managed and run for you. You click create, and then you watch some logs pop up it creates an entirely new microservice landing page within Backstage where you can see everything that's been pre-configured for you out of the box. It connects right into where the code is actually living, where the build is actually running. So you're in GitHub, you can see where the job is actually running for an initial build and deploy. And all of that's been done by one click. You simply walked up, you said, okay, I want a microservice. You hit create and then boom, out of the box, you have that running somewhere and you're able to go in and modify any of the logic that you want to, to realize that new experience, to bring that new feature to Spotify. How does that compare to places that don't have Backstage? Spotify before Backstage or just other places you have experience working at? There's two sides to the Backstage coin there. As an engineer at any of the companies that I've worked prior to Spotify, required me to learn the infrastructure like before I can even get going. Whereas at Spotify, it's a case of, of course, we learn the infrastructure that we've got. We learn all the tooling underneath it. But as a new engineer coming in, the power to be able to go in there and say, read about the services, read about the things. Okay, well, I just want to create something just so I can play with it, just so I can do some experimenting and learn. You can do that in literally seconds from one of the templates. And that's always my favorite demo whenever we go out and talk to customers. Like, okay, yeah, let's create this new service and click in about less than 30 seconds. It's like, okay, here's our service. Let's go and check it out. I remember one place that I've worked where I spent days just trying to understand it was a, a mixture of trying to understand kind of Kubernetes and all of that side of stuff, because that was, at the time, something relatively new for me, but then understand the specific implementations for the place that I was working at. Backstage kind of takes care of that. And I think the other side of that Backstage coin is for the engineers creating those templates. Engineers can build in the best practices that they know for the technologies that they're using. We can build in security considerations. We can build in things like GDPR, all of these things that as an engineer previously, I would have, I still have to be aware of, but I, I'd have to get into really into the specifics and into the weeds. And it really slows me down before I can actually even get started. Backstage, we try and build all of the tools, all of the things around that to make a really good end user experience and a really good contributor experience into Backstage. Again, we're talking about a scale of 20 to 30 million developers across the planet in just a few years. This is going to sound grandiose, but this is, to me, like Ford assembly line type productivity changes that we have the potential to drive. And I think Backstage sits at the crux of doing that. It really allows scaled engineering organizations to keep operating with speed and frankly counterbalance this chaos of so much technological complexity, so many choices, so many tools you can use. What Backstage does is it gives you one hub to really visualize as a developer all of the software that you care about 
and then brings the relevant tools front and center for you to be able to do the three things that you really want to do with that software, which is you want to create new things to sit side by side to grow your product or or build new features. You want to manage those existing things. You want to be able to maintain them. You want to be able to modify them. You want to understand what they're dependent on and who owns them. And you want to be able to explore what what else is out there. You want to be able to to go see what other things people have built that you can build on. And, And so Backstage is really just a single pane of glass for allowing engineers or developers to create, manage, and explore the software ecosystem that's at their fingertips. I think the key to it when it comes to like using it on a day-to-day basis is twofold. I love that people are using Backstage every day, but to me, it should almost fade away into the background a little bit. Like I want the engineers to be focusing on their customer problems and that abstracting away the complexity that Austin was talking about. I want Backstage to be there and take care of that. And in that kind of world, Backstage becomes more, I think, a discoverability tool. I need to go and find some information. I need to just quickly check on the status on something. And Backstage should be really good at solving those problems because then the engineers can go and focus on creating the best music app that they can. So like, what is the Kubernetes plugin and why does Spotify's Backstage need one? Or why is there an open source Kubernetes plugin now for Backstage? Let me just quickly go to the Kubernetes plugin and uh, read more about it on Backstage (laughs) IO. Plugins are a way to say, okay, this is a recommendation or an opinionated experience as a software engineer trying to build a feature or trying to build a product. The Kubernetes plugin, I think, is a a great example and and something that was built by Kubernetes experts who who essentially said, okay, what we're going to try and do is instead of taking an infrastructure point of view on how to run and think about Kubernetes, they said, oh, actually, this is what an engineer who's just trying to build and run microservices to build an end user experience that probably also involves a desktop application and maybe a web app and probably a mobile app. These are the things that they need to care about. This is the sort of things that I want to visualize. These are the knobs and dials that will be relevant to them. These are the things that they probably should care about configuring, and these are the ones they shouldn't. So let's slim down that YAML file. Let's give them the tools they need in the experience of managing a microservice, and let's visualize Kubernetes and give basically commands like CRUD operations on Kubernetes workloads. But let's do that in a way that, that's about an engineer's software and about the experience they're building and not about the infrastructure. You touched a lot on abstracting away underlying technology details, and we specifically talked about Kubernetes a little bit. I'm curious if that's bad in a, some cases, like where hiding details of Kubernetes, mm-hmm. our engineers aren't necessarily learning about some of this new technology, and instead they're really just seeing some UI in backstage and getting a very simple way of doing things and getting the job done. But are they growing and learning and developing as engineers, learning the latest cool technology? Is is there some sort of a bad side here? Yes, we abstract the day-to-day pain away, if you will. Coming from when I was engineering and working with engineering teams now, that's not a bad thing. I think on a day-to-day basis, I think most engineers really like and really appreciate that ability to abstract that away. But at the same time, Engineers are engineers. We all want to know what's going on under the hood. Oh, we've got this great magical box. What's happening inside of it, though? And you do get, or I get, anyway, I get a little bit apprehensive of, well, this is great. I can trust in Backstage. I can trust in all of these things that Backstage is offering me, that the infrastructure will be there, that all my dependencies are all sorted out. But I'm still kind of, there's that little bit in time. It's like, but I don't know how it works. So, so if something goes wrong, what am I going to do? And I think it's a mixture of engineers be engineers. They want to understand the deep, dark details underneath. So they will go and they will explore and they'll find this stuff out. And I think that is also coupled with a little bit of the culture at Spotify. We wanted to know if the backstage experience was everything they claim it is. So we talked to their customers, engineers at Spotify who use backstage every day. My name is Kana Abe. I'm an engineer at Spotify. I joined earlier this year in January 2021. My name is Chantal Delfeld, and I'm a software engineer. I've been here now like five months. The first time that I came across Backstage was during our dev boot camp. They put you in a group with a bunch of other new people, and they give you a project. We worked on an application and basically followed the golden path, which is all hosted on Backstage. And it was so awesome to see like how simple it all was. It's so much nicer having a UI and it's all just 
magically appears. You're like, wait, really? We can do this? We can just click this button and it's going to work? I just open up backstage. My favorite services are like at the beginning. I click add. It'll tell me if it failed. You know, it'll show me the build. It'll show me when it's deployed to. So all I need is that one single tab for that service. And I just move back and forth. As a full stack engineer, I'm, I'm very much interested in getting something to work and like delivering value. So for me, those abstraction layers are, are quite helpful. In other places, there wasn't like a layer that was like the company layer. We would have like Slack bots that were up in place that, you know, would notify when things were changing or being changed. Just having a place where I can just click a button and know that that's going to work, a rollback for me is, is really, I feel safe. I feel like I trust it. In my previous job, I had like a hundred bookmarks to go to different places to troubleshoot. I know that a lot of developers love having multiple app tabs open in their browsers until like well, it almost crashes, <laughs> but I'm not like that. I'm very like specific about having just as few tabs as needed. There are like service pages, there are web pages, there are applications, all these different things that I just keep discovering about Backstage that has been really cool. I definitely have been using it more now to search for other services, to figure out who owns what, to look at repos for a service or find out what person is in what squad for documentation also. Oh gosh, there's so much documentation. My squad has a lot of dependencies. So we are constantly interacting with other squads across the company. It's really important for us to be able to access stuff like documentation to be able to understand how things work. If you're looking at a service and then you can go and look at like their API tab, right? So that helps you look at the endpoints. But if you're trying to like look at more in depth to the code, they also have like a link right there to go to their particular repo. So I don't have to go to the generic GitHub for Spotify and then try to search for a particular repository. Spotify's architecture is just so complex, but yeah, something about the UI and the reliability of it, it feels, feels less scary. <laughs> I'm curious if there was much resistance to this at Spotify early on, because Spotify has this kind of legendary culture of autonomy where it seems like everybody can make their own choices. But now you're saying that Backstage is pushing them to use the same tech and the same standards and this one-click creation that just takes care of everything instead of giving them their choices. So can you talk a little bit about how that landed at a company like Spotify? Backstage is something that has been around Spotify for four or five years and in very different incarnations. And it's something that's grown and evolved with the culture of Spotify. When I say standardization, or, or I hope when we do, it's something along the lines of recommendation or it's guidance. I, th I think it's a, a collaboration because the adoption of if there's a new template in software templates or things like that, it's driven by the engineering teams. It's driven by R&D, not just one place saying, hey, this is the best way to do this. Backstage aims to give the ownership to the squads, to the teams. For example, the team that owns the Kubernetes plugin that we have, like they know Kubernetes way better than the core Backstage teams could or, or necessarily even should. It's a similar story. I want the Backstage squads to focus on Backstage and to focus on the engineers that they're supporting, not to know every nook and cranny of Kubernetes. What we've tried to do is, is within Spotify, have this operating system and, and give people really good tools to build apps, to build plugins. And now we're, we're just trying to extend that also to the open source community and, and figure out ways to share that operating system with the world, allow other companies to run it, and also hope they'll contribute back so that we can all benefit. So let me ask you one more quick question before I let you both go. I want to know what else you like to nerd out about. I'm a nerd in the traditional description, if you will. <laughs> My escape during the pandemic has been like World of Warcraft and stuff like that. So nerd of the highest degree. I love board games. Definitely geeking out. The thing undoubtedly that I'm nerding out on so hard is Formula One. <laughs> we just moved into a sort of fixer upper. So these days for me, it's all about home improvement. I have never been into cars. I've never watched Formula One. I love terraforming Mars. 
and Istanbul is a quick fun game. It sounds so boring, but I've actually been having a lot of fun just learning about how to deal with wasp nests and HVAC systems. And then I became obsessed with the cars, and now I try and understand all the nuances of the cars. I remember one year we played like the Fury of Dracula for so many months and we would play music in Spotify and it was like Dracula music. So <laughs> at the end when it showed me like this is the songs you played the most, it was like all Dracula music. We've been using Backstage for years at Spotify and our engineers have come to rely on it to get their work done. It improves the everyday developer experience, increasing both developer happiness and effectiveness. Which made us wonder, if Backstage can do that for Spotify, couldn't it do the same thing for other engineering teams? So we open sourced it. In the next episode, we'll talk about the challenges of open sourcing such a wide-ranging and ambitious product. Nerd Out at Spotify is produced by Spotify's Ted Vergakis and Seaplane Armada, who also wrote our theme song. Special thanks to our guests for this episode, Lee Mills and Austin Lehman and to Chantal Delfeld and Kana Abe for sharing their experiences as new developers at Spotify. I'm Dave Zolotuski. Thanks for nerding out with us.